first of all, thank you so much for everyone for coming uh, and attending this um, webinar or um, Zoom session. I don't know how to talk about it. <laughs> uh, and I'm so excited about this. Uh, even though I'm not very excited about uh, not having a chance to see everyone in person, but this is the best we can do under uh, this condition. So, to the, um, so today I'm going to, I'm a, okay, let me introduce myself first. I'm, a, I'm Jay Kim, I'm a PhD candidate in political science uh, at the University of California at Berkeley. And this work is actually my joint work with Andrew Thompson. He is a, a postdoc at the University of Notre Dame uh, and which this project investigates how threats shape the politics of marginalized using a natural experiment and machine learning. And as David said, if you have questions, please um, post them in the, in the chat window so that I can, uh, so that I'm gonna uh, respond to those questions later. So I wanna motivate my talk by showing you this um, maybe very famous cartoon. So, uh, so this is a kind of story. So a police officer sees a drunk man. So this is a police officer and sees a drunk man searching something under the street right. And he asks the drunk man, what you are searching for? And he say, I lost the wallet, so I'm trying to find it. So they're, trying to both, they're both trying to find the wallet. And then after they search for a while, they realized that they couldn't find it. So the police officer asked the guy, this is where you lost your wallet? And he said, no, I lost it in the park. But this is where the light is. And you can replace the light as data. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is, to some extent, data availability determines our research questions. So when you're working on a research, uh, when you define a kind of research question, and the next step usually is whether the data is available. And if the data is available, you're happy that you're going to conduct the research. When the data is not available, uh, then maybe that's the first problem you need to um, deal with. And this is a kind of uh, big issue, uh, especially in social science. Oh, there's typer, so please ignore this. <laughs> I just don't understand. So depending on what kind of population you are interested in, maybe that also determines what kind of methods you can use. So let's say your, your research interest is the majority population in the United States and their public opinion. So you are studying, like, let's say, poli uh, um, political polarization in the US and how that's dividing Republicans and Democrats. And if that's your research question, one way you can answer the question is, using available panel data. So there's like a, uh, some good panel data, like the American National Election Study. So you can download that data set and you do some modeling and you can make some, you can make some inferences about those, that population. But let's say you are interested in minority population, uh, African Americans, Asian Americans, Latinx, uh, Native Americans, and so on. And what you're interested in naturally, not just to that population, you are interested in intersectionality. So some kind of intersection like race and gender. So you are interested in not just African Americans, you are interested in African American uh, LGBTQ population. Then that raises much, much harder question for, uh, for you to answer in your empirical uh, question because in terms of data collection, that data um, doesn't exist anywhere in most cases. So you need to find a way to trade it. So that kind of creates a divide between quantitative camp and the quantitative camp for science. So if you're studying big population, it's easy to do quantitative work. But if you're studying small population, marginal population, they kind of do the same level or same scale of quantitative method that's used in, on the other side. And, and, pro, and to me, this is a uh, empirical question, theoretical question, but also a personal problem because I'm, uh, I'm a, a graduate student trained in quantitative method, but I'm super interested in studying marginalized populations. And the, the reason is, if you think about the US politics, on the one hand, it's kind of random that racism exists. There is a racism because public opinion, public policy, and so on. But I'm interested in how marginalized population experience racism and how that you know, shapes their politics, their political behavior, political learning, organizing, and mobilization. So that's something I have been working on for the past couple of years. So there are two takeaways. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but I made only 20 slides. I'm trying to make it shorter because I want to give more time for discussion rather than me just lecturing <laughs> to senior scholars and faculty. That's kind of weird. So, so there are two takeaways. One is um, I'm trying to show that how machine learning enable data intensive research on marginalized population and even causal inference. So that's one takeaway point. 
And the second takeaway point is more practical. So I'm trying to show you that how automating, automating research process has increased research accessibility and, and scalability. So when you are doing a new method or trying to introduce a new method in a discipline, uh, you are trying to have other people to use it. So that's what I mean by accessibility. And what I mean by scalability, it's not like, so it's not only for one project, you can do multiple projects in a series using this kind of method. So that's what I'm trying to uh, demonstrate here. Um, so let's go to the, um, the actual research. So this research take advantage of uh, 9-11, the fact that 9-11 is a natural experiment. So as you can see from the left side, this is a photo taken about the terrorist attack happened 2009-11, September 11, 2001. Uh, actually last Friday was the, uh, uh, the anniversary for the 9-11. And there are many studies in social sciences using 9-11 as a natural experiment. So what I mean by natural experiment is, this is a exogenous shot. It's not something like someone can expect and happen, so they change their behavior according to the expectation. This is a totally out of control event. And, and so in many disciplines, uh, political science, economics, sociology, public health, and so on, they use, leverage this 9-11 as a natural ex experiment and find some causal effects they, they care about, whether that's an electoral outcome, or mental health, uh, you know, labor market outcomes and so on. So this is a very, very known example. And, but, on, but if you take a look at these more than 100 published papers, this, this, these publications literally talk about marginalized populations. And it's a kind of interesting given that, uh, you know, 9-11 is a big historical event, not only for majority population, but also for marginalized populations. So if you were, a member of Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans, uh, South Asian Americans. Um, there's many, many government and, and NGO and academic people saying that these groups who went through discrimination, hate crimes, and so on in the post 9 11 period because the association between Muslims and, and terrorists. Um, so, so, the, so the motivation for the project is then how we can create a data, how we can create data for investigating the relationship between. Uh, in the post 9 11 period, and the, the race in which marginalized population experienced uh, that stigmatized experience, and how that changes their political behavior, uh, you know, in this period. So, we don't, so one, uh, so I started working on this project, and you know, the first way I did as a political scientist is trying to find some information from the American National Election Study, because that's like our largest panel data and the, the highest quality. So, I I went there, I tried to find the same, the, you get the sample size and then it's very <laughs> discouraging. Okay, I'm not gonna do this, it's not possible. So the second step I took is looking at the SMUS paper as an alternative data source. So these communities, uh, Arab Americans, Indian Americans as a subset of the South Asian community, they have new SMUS papers reading back to uh, far, be, uh, far earlier than the 9-11. So these newspapers continuously published articles about their communities, what they care about, and what their issues are about, and so on. And then what I'm trying to do here is trying to turn these ethnic newspapers into sort of like a panel data. So, so because if you look at the SMS paper, they have their publication date. So you can use that as the a time variable, and then they publish some articles, you can, and the different types of articles, and you can use that as a dependent variable. So that's one way you can imagine about the data. Um, so the argument is pretty simple. So I'm not going to uh, dive into deep here about this because it's not a political science or social policy talk, but I'm happy to uh, talk about argument side later if you have questions about it. But I'm trying to focus more on the, <coughs> the methods and the practical ways I'm trying to collect data and use data for my analysis. But the argument is pretty simple and here's just one slide. So basically the argument is if a threat increase information seeking and the, the reason is if there's a threat 9-11, September 11 attacks, something like that threaten the community. That creates uncertainty in the, in the political environment. So if you're a member of, let's say, you're a member of Muslim American, and then after 9-11, you see that like, there's a you know, government state surveillance, negative media reporting. There's like a rapidly changing political environment and uncertainty about your safety. Safety about yourself, safety about your community members. And they kind of encourage us to seek more information. And if these community members to seek more information, that creates demands for these ethnic news, news, uh, newspapers 
to issue more articles about those particular uh, concerns. So the first hypothesis is the September 11 attacks made Arab American uh, and Indian newspaper, American newspaper, that's a subset of South Asian American, uh, publish more articles on US political news related to Muslim communities in the post 9-11 period than in previous years. So that's the, um, the first hypothesis. And the second hypothesis is Beta American and Indian American newspaper published more articles on Muslim population. Uh, so it just, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the second hypothesis. So the reason I talk about the second hypothesis is about, about the measurement. So we all, I was tested to what extent the change the number of articles on the treatment, uh, so after on the Muslim populations in the US was related to the domestic uh, threat. So domestic threat, what I mean is that there's a US state of surveillance and also there's negative media reporting by U US mainstream media, whether it was a reaction to that threat or international threat, because there was a the spread of terrorism, there's a war on terrorism, but there was more reaction about the international than domestic. So if the origin of the threat was more likely to be international than domestic, then the following should be, uh, I assume that the following should be correct. And our American and Indian American newspaper published more articles on Muslim populations outside than the inside the US in the, in the post 9 11 period than in the previous period. So this is a kind of basic setup. So we have, in terms of time period, we have the pre 9 11 period and we have the post 9 period, period. We are trying to measure the number of articles published on US political news related to Muslim communities. That's our main target for the dependent variable. And as a kind of comparison group, we also have the uh, number of articles published on uh, Muslim communities, but out, not inside the US, but outside the US, for this kind of domestic international progress. So, uh, and let's uh, talk about basic worker flow and then collecting data. So basic worker flow is step one, is collecting data from those newspapers. And then, then the rest of it is kind of straightforward. So I'm gonna uh, crash, uh, training a crash fire or machine learning, machine learning algorithm based on that, um, that S newspaper articles. And I'm trying to automate the, um, and then using the, um, so, so when I'm training twin crash fire, you need to play the elaborate a little bit. So what I mean by twin crash fire is, I'm going to crash, uh, train a, a machine learning algorithm based on the sample of the S newspaper articles I collected in step, this step one. And then this step was done by uh, humans. So it's me and my co-author and the three artists. So we are going to take a look at each article and then classify whether it's domestic political news or international political news. So that's what you're doing. And then for the third step, the, and after we train the model, so the model is going to predict the rest of the articles, much larger number whether they are domestic or international. And then we are going to apply in order to time study design to the, to the data to, so that we can estimate the, the, in, the effect of the intervention, the 9-11 uh, on the changes in the outcome. So data source is the um, SN News Watch database. It has uh, 20.5 million SN newspaper articles, and those articles were collected over the last four decades. So this is a large enough size, and also it has a long enough the, um, time span. And then we downloaded uh, 1,132 Arab American and then 4,552 Indian American newspaper articles mentioning Muslims uh, published between 1996 and 2006. So it's a uh, um, five year window before the intervention and five year window after the intervention. And the, the reason we downloaded these newspaper articles rather than using web scraping is because the, uh, this uh, database was created by uh, Procast and then the data vendor prohibited uh, web scraping. So for the copyright reason, I cannot do that. So it took some time to um, download these files. So this is what those downloaded files looks like. So there are 57 HTML files and each HTML file contains uh, 100 newspaper articles. And the next step is then like we need to turn this HTML file into um, a slow CSV file so that you can merge those data with other data you want or work with uh, or applying some statistical modeling to the, to the data. And to do that, I developed um, I package that automatically uh, turn these HTML files all of them once into a single CSF file. So to, uh, and the nice thing about this is you don't need to know about anything about HTML uh, to do this. It just automatically turn HTML files into a CSF file. And it doesn't matter how many files you have. 
So the package takes average initial cost very fast. So package takes uh, average 0 0.0005 seconds to turn 100 newspaper articles into a title frame, which has text, author, source, and date uh, columns. So text one is going to, we are going to use for the um, training model uh, and then applying to the, the rest of text. And then I'm not gonna use also in this case, but these are these source and date are pretty useful. So this date one is critical to turn this text data. Uh, these, so these are basically these other three are metadata. So this is a text data and these other three are metadata. What I mean by metadata is data about text. So this one gives about, you know, which uh, this is basically a newspaper article. So source is basically uh, which particular Arab American or Indian American newspaper. Uh, that's what source variable is. And date variable is when is the publication date. So using this date, you can turn, you can, if you combine date variable and then text variable, then it's going to be time series data, right? And then this the source variable, if you put India and American newspaper together, you can create another variable called group variable. So basically it indicates that whether the data of the observation you have is coming from Indian American newspaper or Arab American newspaper. And these variables are key, uh, very useful because when you are tr trying to construct in an optimal time study design a model that looks like this. You are trying to estimate this one because that shows the, the level change be before the intervention, after intervention. You now have the variables, the observation you can plug into this model. So using, uh, using this text data and their, their metadata, you are you now are able to gather the variables that we are now able to plug into the model that we want to estimate. So for the training classifiers, we um, sample, randomly sample 1,105 articles. That's gonna be 18% um, of total data from the data sets during find one intervention and source variables. So intervention is basically 9-11 uh, uh, variables. So if we, the data, the text data were collected before the 9-11, that's gonna be zero. And if we collected after 9-11, that's gonna be a one. So it's kind of binary variable. And source variable indicates the, the source of the, I mean, whether which newspaper it came from, whether uh, there are two, uh, so they, there are two Arab American newspaper and there are three Indian American newspaper and it indicates that exactly which newspaper the, the observation came from. And I trained the lasso uh, model with text features and selected metadata, intervention, source and group, and then co-authors uh, that's traverse, and then three artists label these articles as a binary variable, domestic or international. So to be um, totally frank about that, honest about the process, we actually trying to measure using a domestic and non-domestic. And then as we started reading and labeling these articles, we then realized that most of the um, non-domestic articles about Muslim communities, that's actually about international politics. So I'm gonna show like one uh, figure that kind of validates that claim. So in terms of the um, classification uh, training results, accuracy is about 73%, precision about 75%, and liquor is about 80%. So this is basically we are training a model against the, bench, the human benchmark. The human benchmark is you know, how uh, co-authors and three artists label these sample articles. And then we divided the, the sample articles into training set and then and the test set. And then we are using train the a machine learning model based on the training set. And then we are predicting against the, the human benchmark and then showing this is the, the accuracy, precision, liquor outcomes we can yeah, you are going to get from the the training model. So it's kind of like a, trying to demonstrate the constructability, whether the measure you to capture or what you're trying to capture. So this basically show the relative or the frequency. So if there was close to this, it's close to domestic theme. If there was close to this, it's close to international theme. So if you look at the international side, the American side, you can see Lebanon, Beirut, and and so on. And on the Indian American side, you can see BJP, uh, and that's uh, one of the two largest party in, in India. And on, if you look at the domestic side, you can see something like um, Muslims, Bushi, discrimination, prof racial profiling, uh, um, war, uh, crimes. As actually, so if you take a look at closely in the, those articles where the word appears, it's actually hate crimes uh, and the turbans and um, and ACLU, that's, America, uh, that's one of the largest uh, advocacy organization working for human rights, uh, advocacy issues in the United States. So this kind of gives us an idea about how 
uh, classification world in more substantive ways. And let's uh, take a look at the uh, raw data and then how the um, ITS design that I introduced earlier fit into the, the data. So you can see that this is a raw data from uh, the, so y axis is the publication count and then x axis is the date. And this is for the, there are two, like I mentioned earlier, there are two um, classification. So we are looking at whether this particular newspaper article mentioning Muslim is about domestic political news or international political news. So the panel A is about international political, uh, domestic political news, uh, excuse me, and then panel B is about international political news. And, and you can see that there is some increase in the number of articles published in the, on the domestic side, also on the Arab and the Indian American. And there seems not much change in the, uh, on the, in the panel B, both for the Arab American and Indian American side. But this is just like a, you know, either check, maybe that's not precise. So we applied um, a regression model to the data. So basically the regression model is what uh, I showed earlier. So we have the intervention that's binary variable and we have a date variable, we have group variable, right? For the control variables. And then we are trying to estimate the better one. And then here, these, um, these, uh, these uh, digital lines, they are predicted values. And then the blue bars around that, that's a 95% confidence intervals. And so you can see the, the big change happening uh, both for the Arab American and Indian American for the number of uh, published articles on the uh, domestic news after the 9-11 and not much on the, um, uh, the, the international news side. But there's still like one problem for the um, confidence interval. So if you think about the error term here, um, so in the, old, in the OLS, I assume that the, there is no um, serial correlation. So, so what I basically I'm saying is that the, what happened in T, T minus one doesn't affect T minus T, but actually that's not true in the time series data, especially in this case, because of what, uh, you know, published in, in maybe um, yesterday or placing, in, uh, influencing what's gonna be published in, today, right? And then the, the trend continues. So I, I change, so that's what the, um, if you look at the OLS, the, the standard intervals, uh, the standard errors are very small. So that's why we have a very high significant value, almost every variable. And then, but if we corrected that times uh, in serial correlation, you are having a slightly wider confidence intervals. And that's why we are seeing, uh, losing some standard error, um, statistical significance. So still, but the, um, for the intervention variable, the 911 effect, you can see that the effect for the uh, domestic count. Um, sorry, my kid is crying outside, so I got kind of a little dis uh, dis distracted, but I'm yeah, trying to focus on here. So, okay, so for the dependent variable, as I showed earlier, there are two dependent, uh, dependent variable. One is for the domestic politics, and the other one is for the international politics. And you can see the effect of the, um, the effect size of the international domestic politics is much higher, much larger, and also it's statistically significant, but not for the, um, but it's much smaller and not statistically significant for the international side. And this is the based on the model that corrected the serial correlation issue. So I, so I've done for the, the modeling part, I'm talking a little bit more about the kind of data science or more software side of the, the project. So like I said earlier, uh, I introduced earlier, I developed an IR package that automatically turns uh, as newspaper articles, like, no matter how many you have them, like 100, 1,000, or 10,000. And I say turn that into uh, one single CSV file that can, you can use for your modeling or visualizing and doing some descriptive or causal inference. So I developed some skill about um, how to use, how to talk, pass HTML file, and later when I work on some different project using not as newspaper article, but using tweets, but this time it's not HTML file, it's a JSON file. I realized that actually the skill I developed for this package actually derived actually transferable to this um, new project. So I developed another package that automatically turns tweet JSON file into a tidy verse lady data frame. So it's kind of showing like how you can scale up your research agenda. So once you know how to parse as newspaper article, you can, and that's based on HTML, then you are now able to talk, uh, pass another type of data that's JSON, that's Twitch, uh, into a nicely cleaned and organized uh, data set. 
So the skills you develop for one project actually transform the other project, which they, if they tackle similar problems. And also it kind of happens to be a research pipeline. So working on this newspaper, that's something uh, I thought about and, 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 and used for my dissertation project, uh, which is now, this chapter is now conditionally accepted at a uh, computational science journal. And now I'm working on this new project that's using uh, SMS paper not for uh, descriptive inference, but for causal inference. And like I told, showed earlier, I, the skill I developed for um, parsing SMS paper, I used this skill to develop another package that automatically parses a JSON file to JSON file into a data set. And using the data set, I um, now developed a COVID-19 paper, which you look at the relationship between how social uh, relationship between COVID-19 and Asian Americans and how, especially how social exclusion shapes Asian American vibrancy. So that combines uh, one, more than 1 million tweets and then uh, a large uh, survey data and then trying to show the impact of COVID-19 on Asian American vibrancy because that has a huge impact for the upcoming uh, election. So yeah, so that's the basically end of the, uh, my presentation. I just wanna like wrapping up by emphasizing two points. One is, um, machine learning or like a computational tools are great to create a new data and you can use the data for descriptive inference also for causal inference. This is just one showcase and I think it's not very sophisticated uh, but still like showing one way practical way you can use new data to um, to, uh, to uh, conduct research on on the study subject. And the second point is when you are doing data science whether um, or computational science everything you do is software. I mean, it's written by, it's a, you wrote some code, whether in Python, R, or whatever language you prefer, and you can automate. So what that means is you can automate the research process, and that is very important because that can help you life easier and your other, other's life easier because it that helps, uh, you know, increases transparency and the possibility and, uh, and also helps you to increase your research scalability uh, and uh, accessibility. So that's the um, end of the talk, and I'm, I'm trying to um, now trying to get the questions in the chat window.